Day zero is the moment before company formation. When a founder decides to take the plunge, follow their dream, and commit to pursuing their vision of change. On day zero, you'll hear founders tell their story. From the initial idea, through reactions by critics and skeptics, setbacks and successes, we'll cover it all. Behind every company is a founder with ambition, goals, dreams, and wisdom to be shared. Let's explore them together. Hi, everyone. My name is Tarun Kapoor, here joining you for day zero, and very excited to kick off this session with uh, none other than Hal Andrews from Trillient Health. Hal, uh, please introduce yourself to the audience. Well, first, Tarun, thanks for inviting me. My name is Hal Andrews. I'm the CEO of Trillion Health, a healthcare analytics firm in Nashville, Tennessee. So, so Hal, before we really get into the, the depths of, of, of Trillion Health, this is not your first rodeo with Trillion. Do you mind uh, sharing with the audience a little bit about your background, about you know you, how you've done this a couple times, and just love to learn about your journey, how you even got to the day zero of Trillion? Well, it's sort of three chapters. Uh, the first chapter was as an attorney doing M&A deals for HCA and surgical care affiliates and HealthSouth. The second chapter was as a development executive for healthcare services startup companies. And then the third chapter has been data and technology. The, the specific way that I got here was uh, this is the fourth time that the team has come in to take over a situation that was in dire straits, a broken company, and to try to turn it around and make lemons out of uh, make lemonades out of lemons. Uh, so, we've had some experience doing that going back to 2007. So far, so good. All right. So, so what really got you interested in your very first go round uh, when you said, uh, like, you know, you said you were an attorney, you're doing M&A, you're working for HCA, not a uh, typical mom and pop shop. And you said, okay, we're, I'm going to go a little bit deeper in a completely different environment. Tell, can you share a little bit more about that experience? Well, the real story is that I'm from Nashville and I had always intended to be in the music business, which is the real, the real anchor business in Nashville. And when I got to the law firm as a first year associate, I told the partners that I wanted to build a, a practice in the music business. And they said, that's fine. You can do that at night. And during the day, you'll do acquisitions for MA, for HCA. And so I did that for four years. I worked on every joint venture that HCA did from 1992 to 1996. And after doing the 13th joint venture, the exact same way. I thought there must be something better. <clears throat> so I went to the law firm partners and said, I'm going to join a, a startup in the ambulatory services space. And they said, well, you know, you have a great career here and you'll be on the management committee and then you'll be on the executive committee. And I looked around the room at the, the partners who were all between 38 and 42. And I asked them which one of them would give up their position on the executive committee for me. And there was a long silence. And I said, that's what I thought. So I decided to uh, jump into the services side on the development side. The, the seed for that was planted by a guy named Carl George, who used to run development for HCA. And when my music business law career ended abruptly, when my client fired me and hired Garth Brooks as attorney, Carl had happened to call me that week and asked me to go to lunch and asked me if I'd ever thought about a career on the business side of healthcare. And I told him, no, I would never even intended to do what I was doing for him. And he smiled and said, well, you should think about getting on the business side because you'd be good at it. And so he, he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. And, and fortunately he was right. All right. So you, you start digging down a little bit deeper, you start looking for these opportunities. And like you said, you, you, you go, you've gone through a couple of these iterations, finding companies that are just maybe good ideas, but not necessarily well positioned. Talk to us a little bit more about how you came into Trillion. Well, I, th I think the, the dot that I would connect is that I view entrepreneurs like songwriters. Songwriters are the ultimate entrepreneurs. They, they 
put their words to music. They stand up on stage. You know, what what we all see is the people standing on stage in front of 60,000 people. And I've been there when it was six. And entrepreneurs are like that. They have an idea that they sometimes put down in writing. Sometimes they put it down in code. And they try to convince the world that their idea is a good idea. Where I find myself is in picking up the pieces where the entrepreneur's initial idea was pretty good, but the execution was suboptimal. And starting in 2007, uh, we found ourselves in situations where there was a, a core idea that had some merit, but there were some things missing and it could have been a, a market fit. It could have been the quality of the product. It could have been an understanding of the market itself. And we, the, the team figures out how to find the, the one good nugget in, in what is at the point we show up a, a disastrous situation and try to reorient the business around that. And so for me, it's really, I admire the entrepreneur just like I, I admire the the songwriter. I don't have the ability to write the music. Um, I very rarely have uh, the, the the seed of the idea that turns into something, but I've developed a skill to to find the thing that might work and focus on that. And so specifically with Trilliant, well, first of all, take us through a little bit about the concept behind Trilliant and, and, and the market it's looking to, to enter and disrupt. So the idea for Trilliant was uh, actually three companies that were sort of stuck. And I had joined the board of a company that was focused on developing relationships with employers on behalf of hospitals. And I knew uh, of another company that was focused on digital marketing for healthcare services for hospitals. And so if, if a patient searched for orthopedic surgery, uh, that business was to serve up an, an ad or a link to a health system that was delivering those services in the market. And both those companies were struggling. Uh, one of them was was making a little bit of money, but was really on a, a secular decline. The other one was losing money hand over fist and had an interesting idea. The sort of the genesis of the idea was that I went to meet with uh, Martin Ventures, which is uh, a venture firm here in Nashville run by Charlie Martin, who at one point was the president of HCA and then the COO of Health Trust, and then the CEO of Arenda, and then the CEO of Vanguard. So Charlie's been in the hospital business since, I think, 1968. And I was meeting with Charlie and the guy who runs that venture firm named Devin Carty. And I said, you know, Charlie, what if we did advisory board in reverse? And what I meant by that was that advisory board was really good at research. And then they began to consult with their clients. And then Starting in 2007 or 2008, they bought a company called Crimson uh, down in Austin, Texas, and and turned that into the Crimson Market Advantage product, which probably every health system in the country's uh, subscribed to at least once over the past 20 years. And then in 2011, they rolled up several other companies and were really trying to present a technology platform to the market. And we knew something about those technology companies they had bought because people involved with Trilliant had been involved in selling three of those companies to advisory board. And we thought that it was going to be a challenge to, to integrate those companies for a variety of reasons. And the pitch to Charlie and to Devin was, why don't we do it in reverse? Why don't we start with local market data and then we'll consult with our clients and then we'll add research. And the key there is the local market data. For almost 40 years now, since, since Michael Sachs first went out uh, to start his own company in the mid-80s, most of the strategic benchmarking and, and predictions in the industry have been national metrics, and they haven't been focused on dynamics in local markets. And from 96 to 2007, when I was doing healthcare services, I visited hundreds and hundreds of markets. And in those hundreds and hundreds of market visits, I've visited hundreds and hundreds of hospitals. 
And when you do that, you realize that healthcare really is local. And it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to understand it. And it's a third thing and an entirely different thing to build analytics at the market level so that you can understand what's happening. And if you think about a market that you're uh, familiar with, the, the greater Philadelphia area, uh, Philadelphia is one great big CBSA, according to the Census Bureau, but there are at least five submarkets in Philadelphia. And depending on which submarket you're in, the needs of the population and the ability to serve those needs are vastly different. Yeah. yeah. You bring up, well, first of all, you, you referenced Michael Sachs and uh, an interesting factoid for, for listeners. You know, that's where SG2 comes from, right? I think it's Sachs Group's number two, his second iteration of it. I didn't, I, I did not know that until right. um, just relatively recently. Uh, the, the second piece you, you bring in is a revelation that in healthcare, well, it's a revelation to us in healthcare, but it's probably shocking that it's a revelation for anyone outside of healthcare in a way wait a minute, you need local data. You don't have local data to understand your market or your market, your local data is just this amalgamation of anything but local data, right? Um, so so is that a f- finding that you've, you know, you've seen as a pattern over and over as you've done this in, in, you know, with specifically in healthcare founding that maybe there are techniques that the rest of the world takes for granted that, Healthcare doesn't. I think that's exactly it. Um, we're trying to bring a level of engineering and data science to healthcare that every other industry has been doing for years. Particularly the the marketing, the consumer marketing industry is uh, certainly the leader in that. I I think of a friend that I know who's worked in the consumer marketing business since the early nineties. And when I described to him what we're doing and the fact that it's novel in healthcare, he just rolls his eyes and, and asks me if I'm really serious. And, and the answer is yes, I am. And so I, I think there's an interesting intersection between lots of discussion in healthcare about consumerism and yet a lack of techniques and technologies to really engage with consumers and to understand consumers the way that Amazon or Netflix or Walmart or CVS does. Can you give us a, a, an example uh, for the listeners of something that we probably would have taken for granted, but in healthcare, you were able to be a brilliant, shed some light on and like, wow. Well, I, th- I think the, the analogy is that is really back to voting. And if you think about the Democratic National Committee or the Republican National Committee, they each have consumer files on all of us. We probably don't want to think too much about what they really know about us, but they have sort of filtered a thousand data elements for each of us down to six or seven that are predictive. And unfortunately for me, their algorithms suggest that I want someone to knock on the door of my house and talk to me about politics, which is not actually the case. But they they know who wants to talk to a person. They know who wants to receive a text. They want to they, they know who wants to receive an email and they understand how to uh, to diagnose who can be moved, whose decision can be changed, what's most likely to change it from an issue standpoint, and then what the, the medium is to motivate that change. And we talk a lot about that in healthcare, but then what we do is we, we think that um, my chart is a consumer engagement app. And of course, I've been in the business since 1992. I know that one of the cholesterol numbers is supposed to be high and the other one's supposed to be low, but I can't remember which one it is. And if I log into my chart, I'm I'm completely lost. And I'm more healthcare literate than than most, and yet I don't understand it. And so I think we we think as healthcare people in terms of clinical data instead of thinking about the preferences of consumers. And one of the things that we've been able to do here is to understand at scale that there are some populations that are psychologically very different and clinically identical. And conversely, there are, there are populations that are psychologically identical and clinically completely different. 
and that manifests in, in lots of ways. But when you get to the census block level, it's really important to understand, again, the, the needs of the customers in your total addressable market. And our focus is to understand what is really the total addressable market for whatever it is that anybody wants to do, whether it's uh, urgent care or telehealth or diabetes or surgery, there are attributes of the consumers in the markets that will influence their willingness to do that thing that you want to do. And depending on the service line, depending on the population, depending on a number of different variables, you can make really great decisions or really bad decisions with sort of a national view of data as opposed to a local market view. Yeah. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share an example that I use, you know, searching from one of the reports you put out uh, right on Trillion Health. So, I, you know, virtual health systems in New Jersey, uh, I think you're, you're referencing the psychometrics profiles out that you have. And New Jersey has the highest percentage of people who obtain medical care, but don't have a primary care doctor and probably don't want a primary care doctor. So I think it's like somewhere around like one out of five. And so we're like, okay, what, you know, should we open another primary care practice? Mm, no, we don't need to open another primary care practice. Or if we are, we actually decided to open another primary care practice, but we're opening a virtual primary care practice. So maybe the person still doesn't want a primary care doctor, but at least if it's virtual and it's super convenient, maybe we have a chance, you know, at doing that versus another bricks and mortar. So, you know, is that the type of examples and that you um, that you would you would run into with your clients? That's a great example. It's it's analogous to another example with a, a large system that went out to build stand up emergency departments in a market. And they they did what we're sort of inclined to do in healthcare, which is they they went to the markets where they thought the people with commercial insurance were and, and they correctly diagnosed the neighborhoods with wealthy people. What they didn't understand was that some of those neighborhoods had people who were more focused on the here and now and who are more likely to pick urgent care as opposed to picking uh, an emergency department. And when you get to the, the detail of, of the psychographic data, you see that there are some people who are always, always, always going to urgent care. They're never going to primary care. They're not even going to the brand name academic medical center emergency department. And at the same time, in the same CBSA, there can be people who are completely different. You could put an urgent care by their mailbox and they drive right past it and go to the name brand academic medical center and sit in the emergency department for however long that took. And those are not oriented by clinical conditions. They're oriented by psychology. And that psychology is like a lot of other things, sort of hardwired into our brain's between the ages of 18 and 24. And once you have that, that mindset, it's really hard to change the behavioral pattern. The only clinical condition that we see that continuously changes people's sort of hardwired nature is cancer. And when people are diagnosed with cancer, they change a lot of things. And one of those is they change their approach to the healthcare system and they become much more willing to follow the, the direction of a primary care provider or an oncologist than they are uh, at other points in their life. Hmm. That's, uh, that's absolutely fascinating uh, stuff, uh, Hal. So thanks for sharing that. So, so now that we understand, you know, the audience understands a little bit more about Trillion Health and what you're trying to do there, let, let's dive in a little bit more about how, as, as a leader uh, within this organization, as well as compared to the other organizations you served, how you've had to evolve your leadership style to fit the needs of the company? Uh, or, or, or is that an assumption, incorrect assumption on my point? You've been able to bring the same approach all the way through. Now, your, your first assumption is the right assumption. I think there is, well, it's, the, the number of changes that I've made in the past 15 or 20 years are um, they're probably too many to count. I think my wife would think that I haven't changed that much. And so I think in, in the work workplace, they call it an adaptive personality. When as a, as a young lawyer, I am 
I was surrounded by people who are supposed to have the answer. And so your orientation is that you're supposed to have the answer. And if you don't have the answer, you're supposed to go get the answer. And then you're supposed to be confident of it. A little bit like a physician. It, it's important to convince people that you're credible. And that's fine in a law firm when you're surrounded by a bunch of other type A personalities, all of whom think they're correct. When you get to the real world, uh, it's very different. And I can remember a conversation with a former boss in 1997 when he, he called me into the office. And I was in a, let's call it a debate with one of the operators in the field. And he called me in and said, you know, you just can't, you can't talk to people like that, right? She's not a lawyer. She's a nurse. And she's coming from a completely different perspective. And you're not going to you're not going to convince her of anything with that approach. And I, I guess I'd say the fact that I remember that first from 25 years ago means it made a mark. When I became a CEO for the first time in 2007, I remember being aware that I probably wasn't prepared. And I talked to a, a private equity friend at the time and who was sort of in the loop about me potentially taking this role. And I remember a call that I had with him saying, I'm not ready for this. And his answer, which was a wise one, was, you're right, you're not, but you're as ready as you're going to be before you do it for the first time. And being a first-time CEO of anything is really hard. It's, it's difficult because you've never done it before. The most difficult part is the loneliness of it. There are things that you know that you can't tell anybody you, and you, you can't tell anybody at work because they'll, they'll worry. They might lose confidence. They might wonder about whether you're going to make it or not. Uh, you can't tell your spouse because your spouse would think that you're crazy for having that job and maybe you should leave and go get another job. And I've, I've had that conversation a couple of times over the years. The, the next thing is, as a first time CEO, I tried to do everything. I, I sort of followed the, if you want it done right, do it yourself approach, which is A, incorrect, and B, wears out your team. And so to think about the evolution, probably the, the most important word I'd use is culture. I learned a trick from a guy named Jack Lord, who used to be the chief innovation officer of Humana and the, the chief medical officer of Humana. Um, experienced board executive. And Jack taught me a, a trick about culture in terms of documenting it every day. And I stole it from him and he knows I stole it from him. And I've been doing that since 2013. It's called the daily update. So every day at the end of the day, I send everybody in the company an email. And now because of Slack, I have to send it in Slack too, because <laughs> they read Slack and they read email. But the and I've sort of modified the daily update. So the daily update is an excerpt from the Daily Drucker, which I think is an amazing book of business wisdom. There's a section called Progress, which is everything that I did that day. So this podcast we're doing right now will be in today's daily update. The the third thing is takeaways, which is what did I learn? And sometimes the takeaways are internal. They're just things I learned about our customers or our business practices. Sometimes they're external. Occasionally, we we broaden it to sort of things going on in the world and, and talk about those and how that affects us. And then the last piece, which is the most important piece, is gratitude. And I think that those things have done more to change me as a leader because they force me to be transparent with everybody at the same time every day. And yes, I do send it every day and people don't believe that you could actually do that every day. And after being here five and a half years, I wonder some days if I'll run out of material, but so far so good. The world, the world keeps producing enough drama for me to have takeaways every day. Every day. So you've done it every day for five and a half years. Every day. Oh, kudos to you. That, that, well, and, and going back to, even going back to the first time I did it, I remember on my one year anniversary at the first company that did this, there was a, an engineer who worked remotely whom I'd never met and he didn't say much. And I'd talked to him maybe once 
And on the one year anniversary, he sent me a note and said, well, I guess you're serious about doing this every day since you've done it for a year. And you just, you know, I don't get a lot of responses to the daily update, partially because I think people are sometimes worried about responding to me in, in that format. But the fact that he watched for an entire year and then sent the note said a lot about the the impact it was making on the culture. How, I mean, I, I can't even imagine the the magnitude of the impact uh, that you've, you know, that this creates. Just a little more tactical. How long does it take you to put that together? Uh, how long is it? Uh, or is the, are those proprietary Hal Andrews secrets? No, no. It, they're sometimes, as I tell the team, sometimes they write themselves. Occasionally we have an early edition where something's happened by 10 o'clock in the morning where it doesn't matter what else happens the rest of the day. This is this is the one thing, as Curly says in City Slickers. Sometimes they take an hour. Uh, I can I think back to the pandemic, the summer of 2020, when we had the the health crisis and the financial crisis and the social crisis. Some days those those took two hours, and that was really trying to keep people focused on the things that we can control and to be thoughtful about the things that we can't control, but but not to to be lost in the things that are beyond our control. So I would say on a a slow day, it takes 15 minutes. On a a long day, it may take an hour, but probably on average 20 to 30 minutes. Okay. Thank you so much. I, listen, I, I'm going to have to commit to uh, doing something similar um, and, and challenge myself to do it as well. And I'm, I'm sure almost all the listeners are going to say, my goodness, you know, this is a CEO of a pretty busy company who does this. Huge lesson learned for all of us listening today. How actually, this is a perfect pivot point because you, you, you referenced in 2020, you know, three massive changes in, in, in society, right, between healthcare and social and, and political uh, all happening. Let's talk a little bit about the current environment that Trillant is operating in under. So, you know, some of these, you know, with obviously, I think, you know, the input of data, new sets of data coming in have been very beneficial for Trillian or your, you know, opening your customer's eyes to the benefit that Trillian can bring. But it's also now midst of very likely, very possibly a recession coming down the pipeline, the pullback in some very frothy valuations and uh, reality has set in, or is the Warren Buffett, the tide has gone out and, you know, hopefully you know, we're all not just wearing our underwear or, wearing at least underwear. Uh, what are you thinking about in the current atmosphere, the current milieu that has you hopeful for Trillian, but also, you know, potentially keeps you up a little bit? I would start at the macro level. And I, I remember going to a presentation. It has to have been 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, for years, the Congressional seat in Nashville has been held by Jim Cooper, and Jim is a very, very bright, very bright person, very thoughtful about health care. Jim was involved in in the mid-90s in trying to uh, craft legislation to to sort of change health care. And I remember a, a conversation in that meeting where he was talking about the true unfunded liabilities relating to, to health care in this country. And the numbers are were incomprehensible then and they're they're even worse now. And I look at this first as a, a problem for America. And there, there are plenty of studies out there about how it's you know not affordable and it's the most expensive and and on and on. But I, I think about maybe a simpler idea of the system breaking. And if I go back to where I started my career, I did a number of deals for Health Trust. Health Trust was spun out of HCA in 1987. And Health Trust was really the rural hospital company in the country, the largest rural hospital company. Um, 
And I went to a number of those markets to try to do deals. And in some of those markets, you could get a deal done. And in some cases, those markets were just immature. So one one market that Health Trust had was in Northwest Tucson. In 1987, it was immature. Today, the, the city's grown up around it. But for every market that was just a little bit immature, there were a lot that were just distressed. And they were in small communities. And ultimately, the community couldn't support a hospital. And we started Trillion with a focus on hospitals because I have seen what happens to a community when a hospital closes. And everybody knows that hospitals are usually a large employer in a market. And everybody knows that hospital wages are good wages in a market. Unless you've seen a hospital close, you don't understand what happens Hmm. to the market when the hospital closes and you lose the largest or the second or the third largest employer in town and you lose the the best wage payer in town and you lose access to health care. And so for me, it starts with how do you how do you keep those vital community assets open to be there for the community? How do you keep them open for the jobs that drive the economy? And I understand the triple aim and I understand the goal of that. Frankly, the wherever the summit of the triple aim is, is not attainable for hundreds of hospitals in this country, maybe even thousands. And so our starting point was we have a, if we don't do something different, we're going to have an access crisis in this country that's very different than what people talk about in terms of an access, a lack of access today. And from that, you say, well, what are the things that that impact that? And the the simple reality is that 100 people can't change $4 trillion of the United States economy. The, the U.S. healthcare economy is larger than every economy in the world except for Japan and China. So how are 100 people going to do that? Well, our part is to try to get people to, to use data more strategically. And one of the problems that I see is a focus on benchmarking that is incomplete and is lagging in time. And the thing the pandemic really brought into focus is the it sort of broke apart the fallacy that, you know, nothing in healthcare ever changes. On March 15th of 2020, everything in healthcare changed dramatically overnight in ways that I I haven't seen anybody predicted or or even could have predicted to think that all of a sudden surgery would be verboten for 60 days is just unbelievable. The, the restrictions about telehealth, my, my second venture back startup was a teleradiology company in 1998. Um, when we were moving MRIs on phone lines, which is much harder than it is today. Um, But to think about all the regulations that overnight just fell apart, practice across state lines, licensure, uh, credentialing, all that stuff just overnight gone. And I think that's what brought to, to bear how bad it could be. Now, I think human nature is to try to forget that stuff. And math is regression to the mean. And to sort of say, well, that was a black swan event and that's not going to happen and everything will snap back to normal and things are not snapping back to normal. And the American consumer is not coming back to the healthcare system. And the, the peak of primary care in this country was in October of 2019. We're not back to those metrics. We're not really even close. And that has an impact on every stakeholder in the health economy, whether it's a a hospital or an urgent care company or a telehealth provider or pharma or medical device or payers, everyone is impacted by the things that have not come back to normal since March of 2020. So Hal, I want to make sure I'm hearing this correctly, right? You're, You're really advocating, I believe you're saying you're really advocating that for some startup any company entering into the healthcare economy, this ecosystem, how do you bring value to the ecosystem? Maybe, yes, you can disrupt the ecosystem, but you can't destroy the ecosystem. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Well, yes. I think the only thing that would destroy the ecosystem in, in a uh, the creative destruction format 
would be the repeal of the tax deduction for employer-sponsored health insurance. If we did that, then chaos would ensue for two or three years, and then things would settle out. And there are large political and uh, business interests that keep that from happening. And so back to what, what enterprises and other parts of the economy do, they get as much data as they can, and they make predictions about the future as best they can, and they adapt on the fly. So healthcare is a, and particularly health systems are a particularly interesting example. Right now, it's it's July 18th. Almost every health system that's on a calendar year, fiscal year, is in the midst of budget planning. And they've all had to go back and ask their data vendor for access to the system because they haven't logged in for 12 months since the last <laughs> time they went through the strategy process. And we make these plans and we make these budgets once a year and we don't adjust during the year except a crisis but there's no dynamic planning there's no dynamic forecasting there's no if we're going to do this uh, then we need to validate these assumptions and you think about again back to how we make decisions most strategic decisions in the healthcare industry are made from inpatient data which represents less than half the volume of services in the country and less than half of the revenue. And we make that off of data that's 18 to 24 months old now for next year. And so healthcare is making decisions on incomplete data that's two to three years old. Netflix is making data decisions based off things they collected yesterday and last week and last month and last quarter and then they're adapting on the fly. And so is everybody else, Amazon, Walmart, Target, Procter & Gamble, every other really consumer focused business changes their direction when the data changes and the data changes daily. And we're not oriented that way in healthcare. And so our little contribution, we're not even trying to get people to change, <laughs> change based on daily data. We're just trying to get them to look at it monthly and to make, changes in decisions about what happened 45 days ago instead of 36 months ago. Some uh, really poignant lessons there, uh, stuff that um, you and I have chatted in the past, but I continue to learn from you every time I hear you talk. So thank you so much for that, Hal. You know, let, let's just close out with a, let's close out with a couple of a little factoids. Where did Trillion Health come from? Where did the term, the name? <laughs> well, we, we were mer merging three companies together. And so everybody fixated on try. And the first, the first thing that came back from somebody who was there in the early days was T-R-I-A-S. And we all said that out loud and thought, nope, that's probably not what we want to call it. And uh, Devin Carty at Martin Ventures said, well, what about Trillion? It'll be brilliant with a T. And I said, great, we'll do that. And so the conversation lasted almost five minutes and we just were off to the races. I haven't looked back since then. What, what do you think uh, makes you most excited regarding Trillion in the upcoming years, uh, months, years? You know, it's like uh, as you're seeing what's happening in the healthcare economy, seeing a lot of clouds, dark clouds in the healthcare economy, what, what gets you most excited, most hopeful for the company? I think for the company, it is that we, we've we just finished an amazing amount of work that's been ongoing for three years on the data engineering side. And I think one of the, the fallacies of healthcare technology is that it's about the data science. And data science is functionally a labeling exercise against which you run computing power. And it it works in small batches. It's hard to make it work at scale if you don't have data engineering. And just part of our progression, when we started down this path a few years ago, to get data to the customers, to actually process the data took 36 days. And we've been working on that all along. We knew 36 days was gonna make it hard for us to get information to people every 30 days. And we now have that down to six hours. Hmm. And so we're, we have 
almost two petabytes of data in the database and we can process it in six hours. And that speed and that scale allows us to respond to customer requests at, at unprecedented speed and scale. So um, a large system last week asked us to, if we could, for all the physicians in a three-state area, give a summary of all the prescriptions they wrote. And we ran it the next day and gave it to them and, and then said, now the problem is it's 70 million rows and y'all don't have a, an ability to ingest that. So for us, it is the ability to respond to the ever-changing needs of the customers. The, the chaos and, and the challenges that the healthcare economy faces are forcing people to think about things in a different way. And we were, we were founded to help people think about things in a different way. So there's, there's an opportunity there that is broader than I ever imagined five years ago. Um, as I tell the team and I tell our board, potential means you haven't done it yet. So there's potential, uh, but there's also a lot of work ahead of us. So Hal, closing question here, you know, given our day zero podcast is, is really geared towards so many people who are in the early stages, who, who want to understand what it's like to found a company, some pieces of advice uh, that you'd like to offer. And you've already given us probably at least a half dozen. Any other ones that are top of mind or you just wanted to re- reiterate that because they were, they were so crucial to your development? I'm going to go back to the my boss who called me into, my, into his office and told me I couldn't talk to the nurse that way. That was 1997. In 2000, I remember in February of 2000, we went to eat breakfast at this little pancake place in Nashville called the Pancake Pantry, which if you haven't been to Nashville, make sure you go there when you come. And he told me the most important thing to do is to find your passion and not chase the money. And I was thinking about that this morning as I was preparing for this. I think the, the way that I would rephrase that is it's a lot easier to find a job where you make a lot of money than it is to find something that you're passionate about. And there you can always make more money. It's really hard to find something that you're excited about every day when you wake up. And my my history is to sort of follow the muse. And I, I sort of got here inclined to just sort of follow my own instincts and what I thought was interesting and not chase the most money, which is different than, you know, I'm a capitalist too. But there are lots of things that you can do where you make a good living, but but they don't stir your passion and you don't have a noble purpose as we call it around here. And for anybody who wants to do that, I would first say, find something you're passionate about. Don't, don't find something that's just a good idea or a clever way to arbitrage the fact that the regulatory environment hasn't caught up to what's really going on. Find something that really is almost like oxygen to you, that you, you're willing to give up, um, a lot to, to chase because it takes, it takes a lot of sacrifice to chase an entrepreneurial vision. The second thing is, and I'll end with this, there, there's an old saying that there are two things that are certain in life, death and taxes. And I would tell every entrepreneur, there are actually four things that are certain. There's death, there's taxes, there's the fact that it's going to take more money and the fact that it's going to take more time than you thought. And whatever you think, it is in terms of money, double or triple that, whatever you think it is in terms of time, double that, and you'll maybe be close to correct if things go your way. What a great way to finish our conversation. Hal Andrews, Trillian Health, on behalf of uh, the entire team at the Day Zero uh, Studios and Podcasts, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. 